are you feeling? Very excited. Making history. And also, there's going to be a lot of very pleased people at the school. It's not just a tech thing. You know, it's not just a new invention. It's something that can actually help real people. So it's fun. It's it's fun to do that. And exciting. It gives you gives it all meaning, not just interest. Living at the bottom of Africa can really make world affairs feel like things that just happen somewhere else. So in 2014, when I heard the word Bitcoin for the first time, I made it my mission to find out what is so wrong with the way things are that people are trying to change the financial system for everyone. The thing about storytelling, though, the story you expect is never the one you find. I reached out to friends to find out who knew about this thing called Bitcoin. And I was pointed in the direction of Larian Gamarov. Within four minutes of receiving my email about being interviewed on Bitcoin, Larian responded saying, "Yes, I do believe that this will impact our lives as much as the internet has done." So, can you first explain to me what cryptocurrency is? All it is essentially is a mechanism for being able to transfer digital assets without there having to be a duplicate of that digital asset. I'll give you an example. If you have an MP3 or a, a digital photo, it's very easy to make a copy of that digital photo or MP3 and send it to multiple friends, or what this term is called double spend. In 2008, an anonymous developer or engineer or financial guru devised a way to create a, a digital currency, which essentially solved that problem, where you could create a digital asset that could be transferred from one owner to another and couldn't be easily copied. 2011. I read a blog about uh, an underground website that was using this new uh, internet currency that was different from any other currency that had ever come before it. And I immediately decided to try and play around with it and see where it would go, and acquired a number of them where they were worth very little. And then over the years, I've just seen the usage explode, and people come around to the idea that this could very well be the next innovation that disrupts and upturns our lives and has a massive positive impact. There are thousands of cryptocurrencies out there, and they're quite diverse in terms of what their intentions are and what they were designed to do. So for me, the discussion begins with Bitcoin. It's the proto cryptocurrency. It's the first one that mattered. When you first geek out about Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency, you tend to become very excited about the the tech itself. And I think I made the mistake quite a few times early on of getting too technical when I'm just speaking to my mum or my wife or friends who just want to understand how it works. It's digital money. In 2016, we attended the Bitcoin and Blockchain Africa conference so we could hear people who get it explain it. There was a woman on stage from Botswana who educates people on both the potential and risks of Bitcoin. After she shared her personal story, I snuck over and slipped a piece of paper into her hand with the hastily scrawled words, I'm making a documentary and I would love to interview you. Come, come, come. Welcome to my farm. This is a very small uh, farm that I started in 2017 when uh, the Bitcoin market went a bit up. I managed to buy the goats and I bought myself some chickens and I set up the farm and also managed to buy myself this car. That is why it's, it has got all these Bitcoin stickers. You can come and check out my goats. They're like way cool. The other ones are not yet here. I think they're still in the bush. The humble beginnings. <laughs> I'm hoping uh, in the future I'll have like much, much wider uh, farm as I continue in my journey of Bitcoin. So this is a Bitcoin farm. But instead of mining Bitcoin, I'm mining goods. <laughs> the piece of land I got it in 2011. So from 2011 until 2017, there was nothing happening. I couldn't, you know, clean it up I because I didn't have money. Some of my goods are coming. It's one of my passions beside uh, teaching people about Bitcoin. My husband is the one who's always like coming here most of the time. Because as for me, I'm always like busy doing my education and doing my Satoshi Center and sometimes touring. 
people have flooded Africa with a lot of scams and a lot of our people are falling into those scams. So I'm not basically only focused on Botswana where my education is needed, I go. <laughs> the whole idea of the farm is so that you, know, you can be able to sustain myself. I'm just educating people without making any profit out of it. For me, education yeah, is very important, even though I get stressed when you know, my life is, is not working according to plan and my vision for the center is not like really accomplished, I would say. But I'm always grateful for the Bitcoin community because they are really a super amazing family. Everyone in the Bitcoin space is amazing. The original document that outlined the vision to reinvent the world of finance and technology was released in 2008 against the backdrop of the financial crisis. In order to understand all of that, the most obvious place to start was money. What is money? Where did it come from? And why isn't the way it works working for us anymore? You know, one of the first things we figured out to do that really distinguished us from the other animals on this planet was invent language and a way of communicating with each other that could convey very complicated ideas. We could have armies of hundreds or thousands of individuals where other great apes would only be able to organize in you know, clusters of up to about 100 individuals. So that gave us an edge. Language was extremely powerful as an organizing mechanism. But the thing we needed next was a way of making our trust in each other portable. We used seashells, baboon bones were a popular form of currency in Africa. But money is and always has been a form of an IOU note. I could give you something and you could trust that that thing had value because society believed it did. Things like dollars and rands. We call those fiat currencies and, and fiat is a Latin word that means let it be done. It basically means that they have value because governments say they do. Governments tell us that you will use this money, you will accept it as repayment of debt and you will pay your taxes in this currency. So it really is just because we say so. There was a period where fiat currencies were backed by the gold standard and now really money is just backed by a government's ability to enforce taxation within its borders. Governments or their central banking authorities can print as much money as they want to. The decision to print money is something that lies with a few individuals. It's open to flawed decision making. And really it's, it's fair to say that fiat money isn't backed by anything. For a time, Bitcoin felt like a lot of talk and very little action. But Larian was taking Bitcoin out of academia, out of the future and creating a real world use for it in 2015. Something tangible for the world to see. If you consume electricity, you're going to have a meter installed at your property. There's two modes that that meter can be in, either postpaid or prepaid. Postpaid is where you just consume the utility and at the end of the month, somebody will come and read your meter and then send you a bill and then you pay. You're consuming first and then you're paying. Now, prepaid meters are trying to solve the problem where people are consuming and then not paying, which is a problem we have. And it's showing itself in our energy provider, ESCOM, where they say they don't have money to maintain their power stations because they can't recover from the municipalities. The municipalities can't recover because nobody wants to pay for the utility. They've already consumed it. So they're trying to close that gap by switching all their customers onto prepaid so they can't consume unless they've paid. But it then introduces another problem from the consumer's point of view. At least 80% of Africans are unbanked. If they want to make a payment, they have to use cash. Obviously now the costs are increased because the vendor has costs and there's traveling costs, security costs. So although prepaid systems will solve the recovery from the utilities point of view, it doesn't solve anything from the consumer's point of view. Bitcoin is a payment system, which is an electronic payment system that is outside of the banking system. Anybody who has an app on their uh, mobile, mobile phone, not doesn't even have to be a smartphone, they can easily become part of the Bitcoin economy and have access to electronic payments. So it's just a common sense thing, if you think about it, that being able to make Bitcoin a payment method for a prepayment system opens up that massive market and has the opportunity to drastically reduce costs and uh, increase efficiency, uh, at least uh, uh, from the perspective of the consumer. So now there's a solution, Bitcoin, and applied to smart metering can solve a massive problem throughout Africa as well as Latin America and Asia Pacific. Jamela, I started uh, my journey with Bitcoin 
in a little bit of a sad way. Can you tell me that story? My son. <laughs> like right here on the wall. In 2007, I gave birth to a baby boy. His name was called Pako, which means praise. He was born with a heart defect called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I was looking for ways in which I can raise money and probably take him overseas. It was kind of difficult here in Botswana for, for them to promise me anything. One time the doctor told me that there's literally nothing that they can do. When we brought to South Africa, I was very happy. I said, my son will get help. But they said to me, for us to be able to help your son, we finish first with the list that is in South Africa for children who need transplant. So I went online to try and do freelancing so that maybe I can be able to raise more funds to help my child. And I remember I got across a survey where they say you can do a survey and you can you know, be paid in Bitcoin. I went through that, worked you know, my heart out. I never got any Bitcoins from the work that I did. A lot of things that I met were scams, one scam after another. And then in April on the 4th, my son died. So, yeah. first time I heard about Bitcoin was to raise money for my son. So when he died, it, I felt like I have lost the purpose for why I should work online. So I just stopped. Something was just nagging me in my head, like, you know, you need to go back to that Bitcoin thing and look at it and see if it can be of any worth. The more I read, the more I get learned, I decided, let me take another step further. It's no longer about my son. Now it's about changing my country. It's about changing the people. I will group together people and I will teach them about Bitcoin. So 2013, I did my first meetup. But before the meetup, I did a video <laughs> which I put on YouTube. I did an old t-shirt with my Bitcoin address and I was like, I want to work for this company. Even by then, I don't even understand what Bitcoin was. Like for me, it was more like a company. <laughs> then uh, 2014, my, my group was growing. And I kept on educating people about Bitcoin from that moment onwards. So why can we trust that crypto is worth something? Bitcoin, as, as a, a primary example, has a finite supply which makes it a deflationary currency. It actually, in very real terms, is scarcer than gold. There's no central authority that can decide to raise interest rates or to print more money as a part of quantitative easing, the Bitcoin network runs itself. Once the network was set in motion, that system, uh, you know, runs by consensus. Can you tell me about Tusizo? Sure. Imagine a poor school in, in Africa. They have a, a Bitcoin meter. Anybody from anywhere in the world could pay for a week or a month's worth of electricity directly without having to go through that organization. And I actually thought, instead of just talking about something, why don't I go and do it? What does Osiza mean? Osiza is a Zulu word that means help. The whole point of this project is to kind of relieve the burden of the electricity. I mean, obviously there's a lot more things to be paid for in the school and these schools have small budgets. Um, if they can have that burden lifted a little, where they, they don't have to uh, actually pay for the, the utilities, then they can then spend what little they have on other things. One of the struggles that we've had is trying to get a, a metering company to agree to the project. A lot of these metering companies make a lot of money on the vending solutions they supply, taking the fees uh, you know, from the, the, the fiat uh, transactions. Now, having a blockchain-based uh, system means that uh, the funds go directly through to the meter. And so the metering companies that we've been dealing with weren't willing to go along with the project. So it was quite an uphill struggle. But luckily we have found some enlightened partners. We've got about two bars out of the three. So I think communication should be fine. But we also have an antenna. So what we can do is perhaps bring an antenna through here just to boost the signal. Once we get the donation going through and the meter can pick up the payment on the blockchain, the next step is for the actual meter to, to switch on. And then we should see the school light up. It'll be hard to see now, but at least we'll see uh, something happen. 
and then on Monday night when it's all pitch dark, I think it'll be quite spectacular when, when everything goes on. That's the theory. Uh, very exciting. The blockchain is the operating system that it runs on. So you can see it as your Windows or your Linux or Mac OS X. The software layer is the blockchain and Bitcoin is an app that runs on top of the blockchain. Blockchain is the magic behind the money, but really it's just a decentralized database stored on a very large network of computers all over the world. It is the technology that underpins Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but it's not just for monetary transactions. You can use it to store data like patents or wills or to exchange anything of value such as products, property, services, and even votes. The authenticity of the exchange of value or transactions is verified by the community as a whole rather than by a single entity, removing the risk of a single point of failure in the system. Each transaction is recorded on a public, distributed ledger that can be viewed by anyone in the world. The blockchain is a decentralized system. And the strength of the blockchain is that everybody is checking everybody else. No single institution is in charge of this information. Now that differs from the current financial system that we actually do have all over the world. In the case of South Africa, in the center of our financial system is the South African Reserve Bank. And the Reserve Bank checks all the other banks and all the other banks check us. And that's the difference between a decentralized system the blockchain, for example, and a centralized system. If I, for example, want to give you government money or central bank money, and I do a transfer from my cell phone to your cell phone, it is impossible for me to transfer money from one bank account directly into another bank account. We think that is what happens, but what really happens is that I send a message to my bank, which will send a message to the central bank, which will send a message to your bank to make a deposit into your bank account. So there's somebody else always in charge. There's always a middleman somewhere between my account and your account. So who invented blockchain and Bitcoin? The creator of Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency and the technology is Satoshi Nogamoto. People think it's a group of people or it could be an individual. He's a complete mystery. No one knows who he is. People have their suspicions. I have my suspicions as well. Uh, several people have come out to claim that they are Satoshi Nagamoto. I think it's quite nice that it's a mystery. I like the fact that I don't know who it is and I think we would be disappointed if we found out who it was. So why did you name your dog Satoshi? <laughs> Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and blockchain technology has taken over my life. I love Bitcoin, I really do, and I like what it stands for. And uh, the name suits him completely. <laughs> I'll organize small talks and I'll go around. I've been in Khaburoni and I went to Francistown to go and teach people about Bitcoin. I met students who are into IT. We talked blockchain and all that. And I began to tell them about the possibility of changing the way things are in our country, the way things are in the world. I was inspired by Satoshi Nakamoto you know, liberating the people from what was happening during the financial crisis, coming up with something that will really help people. The Satoshi Center's vision was to create a community lab where people can come and learn about Bitcoin and also be able to be very creative. Somebody came up with this idea of making it possible to trust the record of ownership of money without trusting any individual in the ecosystem that makes things work together. And that is such a clever invention that we have to make it work and make it valuable in the way we apply it to society. If you compare it to the traditional financial system, I don't think any of us really get excited about going to our bank or excited about logging on to a, a banking system. One of the disadvantages of cryptocurrency is the, the complexity still, that we're working with a very rough technical thing where you need to understand things like the transaction fees and things like that. But to be fair, if you compare it to the traditional financial system, that's not really clear as crystal either. It's really very difficult to understand how banking fees are going to apply to you, what's it going to cost to transfer 10,000 rands to a US bank account. Things like that are also very, very complex. 
What we're going to basically do is an auction. The item in question is this over here, uh, which is a 100 Rand note. We're going to be bidding for this 100 Rand note. It's a standard auction. Whoever wins the auction gets the 100 Rand note. Slight switch, though, on the traditional auction model is that the person who comes second has to pay whatever their bid was, but they don't get the note. So I'm going to open it up at 10 Rand. Would anybody pay me 10 Rand for 100 Rand note? Who's first? 10 Rand. We've got 10 Rand in the back. 180 Rand going once, 180 Rand going twice, sold for 180 Rand. You can come and settle afterwards. And uh, the person who came second used to settle with me as well. <laughs> it's not that central financial authorities were a bad idea. It gave us a way of scaling up to what now is the global financial system. It gave us a way of trading with each other. You could travel to the other side of the world and you could start to trade with people there. And, th and that was fantastic. Uh, but where it has failed us, for example, is where human greed has been able to manipulate the system, to put it quite bluntly. That's the uh, second highest price I've ever gotten for 100 Rand notes. It's a great game for me because I essentially now have made 310 Rand <laughs> and parted with 100 Rand, right? <laughs> the game, of course, is rigged. It's designed so that I'm going to win. And it has to do with the irrational mindset people have around money. We all remember what happened with the financial crisis in 2009. In that situation, we were reminded again that banks can fail. We have a fractional reserve banking system in most countries where banks don't actually have to have all of the money that they're storing on behalf of their customers. They only need to keep enough of that money around that they can satisfy all of the withdrawals requested in any given period. When a bank gives you a loan to buy a house, for example, they don't have to have that money either. That's basically money they can make out of thin air. But when you have a run on the bank, when there's a crisis and everybody tries to pull their money out of the banking system at the same time, banks don't have that money and that causes them to collapse. Governments then stand as uh, what we call a lender of last resort. So governments say, if the bank doesn't have enough money to sort out all of its customers, we'll step in and we'll lend them the money to do that. But of course that money needs to come from somewhere too. And so what happened in 2009 was you had banks which didn't have enough money to pay all of the people trying to withdraw their money. The US government didn't have enough money to act as a lender of last resort. And so the US taxpayer effectively had to bail out a bank with a tax-free, non-reversible loan that never had to be paid back to the taxpayer. Now, it doesn't really matter how you present that story. It doesn't strike me as fair. Every country's economy is intertwined with every other country's economy. Imports, exports, investments, and the world reserve currency meant that the financial crisis in America became the global financial crisis. The saying before 2008 was that the banks were too big to fail, but the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Over a decade later, there are now banks that are even bigger than the too big to fail banks of the financial crisis years. Hi, my name is Big Mashabo and I have a question for the chief economist. So I'm an economic student, right? And I'm not sure if you've noticed, but a lot of the people in the Bitcoin space, they know more about economics than most PhD students in universities, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is because in university, we're not particularly exposed to different other schools of economic thought, like the Austin School of Economics, for example. And if we're not exposed to certain things, then we won't question certain things. For example, like money. In school, we're not particularly taught what money truly is. What is your opinion of Bitcoin being used as a way to escape uh, this economy that's exist, that exists right now? You're absolutely right that in our universities, we should teach other schools of thought as well. And a very important school of thought is the school of thought of real freedom. And I've got a suspicion this new technology will really put the power in the hands of the individuals and allow us to experience that real, real freedom and not... To, to enslave us the way that politicians have been enslaving us for the last couple of hundreds of years. This is a real freedom, but not only is it a real freedom, it's very, very dangerous, and with that goes a huge responsibility as well. 21-year-olds don't normally go to events like we did the other day. Yeah, yeah. That's not a normal 21-year-old thing to do. <laughs> Usually like clouds and stuff, right? Yeah. First time I heard about Bitcoin was from a movie called Dope. This movie didn't cover uh, Bitcoin like in a positive light. And then I heard it again and I was like, mm, maybe let me like look at it and like do some, a little bit more research. 
And then that's where I fell down the rabbit hole, as the saying says. My economics teacher was heavily into gold. So he was explaining central banking, right, and fractional reserve banking. And inside I was like, whoa, like, this seems a little bit shady. He explained that we actually don't need the system. In a normal economy, things are supposed to get cheaper over time, not expensive over time. And the common thing that I'm hearing on the news or YouTube is that, no, we need inflation so that there's economic growth. I did a little bit more digging in, and, I, and then that's when I found like Mises. They follow the Austrian School of Economics, right? And then they explained that, no, we actually don't need inflation for economic growth. And in fact, that, like, that whole statement is a whole contradiction in itself. When you define economic growth, it's the increase in production, right? And the increase in production causes prices to decrease. An example of this would be like technology. When the first phone came out, it was like quite expensive. And then eventually there was a lot of people contributing to different designs, basically providing alternatives to smartphones. And then the prices of smartphones decreased over time. That also could apply to the economy as whole. Well. And now I know that this person, what he's saying on TV, it's like, that's oh, a nonsense. And then, like, what can I do about it? It's like, buy Bitcoin, bro. <laughs> Using this greedy algorithm, I can make a lot of money. And actually, the only way you could have won that game was to not play it. The problem is, when you have money on the table, human beings start acting in a very curious way. But I want to use this auction as an example of our banking system. And in fact, the financial system that runs the world today. Because it is rigged. There are rules that have been put in place that mean that you will lose every time you play. And somebody will make a lot of money because they control the algorithm that ensures that you lose. Our current banking systems, while they're useful for things like buying carrots and going to the movies and stuff, are exploitive and they're exclusionary and they cut out a lot of the world. And we don't have to play the game anymore because we have the technology now to opt out. Money was always centralized, was always opaque, was always exclusionary, had too many middlemen, too many rent seekers, too many people, quite frankly, benefiting from exploiting others. Finally, we could use the internet to create a financial system that benefited everybody potentially, that was resistant to censorship, that nobody could take control of. That's what the world had been waiting for. And finally, it arrived with the Bitcoin network. You know, I was never interested in, in all these subjects, you know, these econo economics and finance. And um, since Bitcoin, uh, like I became interested, you know, I would still be living in my oblivious uh, way, uh, hoping that whoever's running the system is running it fine and that we don't end up in the same way that Zimbabwe ended up where their money became worthless. It's not so much about not having a long term view, it's just about being educated on this. Uh, and the majority of people, aren't educated on this. Can I just go on and say something else that I Absolutely. think is important? Absolutely. Okay. If we use a blockchain system, the power is actually where I believe it should be, and that's in the hands of the individuals. We do not need the permission to transfer money between my account and your account. And that, of course, also opens the possibility for things like, for example, fraud and tax evasion and all sorts of illegal things. And it, the responsibility is also in the hands of the individuals, the way I believe it should be. Why? Why should we have that kind of responsibility? In all instances, when governments got involved with money, in all instances, without one single exception, they have either destroyed the money or they are in the process of destroying it. So don't think that a politician or a central bank is in a position that you can always trust him. It's just another individual, just another human. And they always make mistakes and it's inevitable. But ideologically, I also believe that I should have the right to decide for myself whether I want to lend you money, whether I want to borrow money. It's not up to some politician or some other institution to tell me what I can and what I can't do. That's my business. There exists a definite two-camp divide over whether Bitcoin should be used to facilitate liberty and self-sovereignty, or if it should be regulated to protect users. Can you give me an example of some of these crazy schemes that people are coming up with using crypto? There's so many. I remember, <laughs> but mostly they're coming from South Africa. <laughs> So in the very beginning, I remember they used to like call me and try to recruit me. They said like, you have got a network of people who can make a lot of money. I'm like, I'd rather be poor 
than to join something that at the end of the day I'll hurt my own people. There's always a joining thing, it's like a pyramid scheme. The lady came to our office, she was like really heartbroken because um, she has put a lot of money into a scheme and then it disappeared. You know, people actually put their children's school fees. What I know is once you, you start having an influx of people calling and say they want Bitcoin, know that there's a scheme coming up. So they are good in the sense maybe they make Bitcoin to be used a lot, <laughs> but at the same time, they are really bad. The, the bad surpasses the good. One of the biggest challenges to explaining Bitcoin is to if somebody who comes already with the pre-knowledge of what Bitcoin is and then they come to you and say like, how much do I join? How, how would I make money very quick? You try to convince the person that it's not about joining, it's like a revolution, it's like a new technology arising altogether. It's about you understanding, they're like, no, but it's not that. The pros for me is liberation freedom, the ability to be able to control your, money, your own money, or the ability to send any amount of crypto or carry it. Imagine if you were to carry a chunk of gold, you want to pass through the border or whatever, you can't. So that's the beauty of, of Bitcoin. The negativity is people using it wrongly, you know, making our people poor. Also lack of regulations and stuff. If you can have maybe some sort of regulatory framework, it would also help protect us. I know you cannot control it because of the way it was created, but just regulations, you know, it, it can help a little bit. Since Bitcoin's early days, it's been shrouded in mystery and controversy. From the bankruptcy of Mt. Gox, one of the early exchanges, to the infamy caused by the dark web Silk Road marketplace that accepted Bitcoin for nefarious goods and services. While Silk Road became one of the first use cases for Bitcoin, it also perhaps put the mainstream adoption of cryptocurrencies years behind where it might have been otherwise. It was run by Dread Pirate Roberts or uh, Ross Ulbricht. If you follow the news, you know that Ross Ulbricht was found guilty by a jury. The federal judge took his activities very serious and she actually sentenced him to serve a life sentence. They counted at least six individuals who had purchased narcotics off of Silk Road and died as a result. What we uh, basically are focused on, one, is criminal offenses involving digital currency, which could be any sort of crime, whether it's narcotics, whether it's murder for hire, whether it's identity theft, and so on, in which the bad guys are utilizing Bitcoin rather than other forms of money because they, in our experience, believe it to be untraceable, which is clearly uh, an accident on their part, um, a, a misunderstanding, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but we also deal with the regulation of exchanges and money. Okay. <laughs> Very nice. Don't touch! Don't touch! No, yeah. But be careful. Every single transaction that occurs in the Bitcoin network is recorded in something called the blockchain. A public ledger of every transaction that's made. The only problem is that even though you can see every single transaction, and you can see the addresses, which are like the account numbers of the people or that are holding those Bitcoins, you don't actually know who those addresses belong to. So the correct term isn't anonymous, it's pseudonymous. Cash tr is truly anonymous. If you have a suitcase of cash and you go and um, spend it, there's no way that that transaction is recorded. So Bitcoin is less anonymous than cash. And we certainly know how cash can be used for nefarious purposes. We know that uh, suitcases of money and drug deals happen all the time. There was a name that kept coming up in conversation and research. And for his name alone, it felt necessary to meet him. Fluffy Pony. It's a nickname that stuck years ago that, despite his best efforts, Ricardo is not able to get rid of. But amongst the noise of the crypto world, Fluffy Pony definitely stands out. Why is privacy so important and how is it lacking in the way we currently do things? Privacy is the natural state of things. You're not closing the door at the bathroom because you want to plot to overthrow the government. You're closing the door at the bathroom because you don't want people to see you on the loo. There's certain aspects of our life we want to keep private that we might reveal to certain people. Uh, we hopefully take our clothes off in front of the person we're married to, but we don't go and walk around the shopping center naked. But privacy has become, it's sort of become overshadowed by, oh, bad people want privacy, or things like, if you have nothing to hide, then why do you care about privacy? 
It's not about wanting to hide it from everyone, it's just that we want to control who sees the information. If law enforcement or the government want information about me, they should have to come knock on my door to get that information. They shouldn't be able to just get that information because my bank is telling them about every transaction I've ever done. I know people say there is, there is information on the internet, but it's different. If I'm able to like really expand on the information maybe you picked from the internet and make you understand, it makes me feel good. Because I know I've empowered you, you'll take the same knowledge and you, you give it to someone. So if I'm able to reproduce somebody who does what I do, that's the real deal. That's the real deal, yeah. Had it not been for him, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Like, he made me to know about Bitcoin. So, because I was trying to help him during that time, now I'm helping people with knowledge. So it's like, you know, transferring whatever that I wanted to do for him now, he's somehow doing it for the people through me. I continue to honor him and, yeah, will be my baby forever. <laughs> yeah. When I got introduced to Bitcoin, I was like, okay, let me save. Each month I save, I save, I save. I'm thinking more about the future, what's going to happen in the future, and I orientate my actions today that will impact the future. I mean, that's the reason why I'm studying, right? I'm like seeing like a really like some interesting stuff in the space of crypto. I'm not saying I'm against banking. I'm just against fractional reserve banking. So I orientate my actions towards that, the new financial system. I would be a lot more stressed if I didn't have Bitcoin, honestly. Why? Let's say, for example, if we have the central bank governor and decides like, yo, I'm going to print like two trillion rands into the economy. The consequences of that would be hyperinflation. I can't remember who said this, but it says that Bitcoin is not about getting your money out of your country. It's about getting your country out of your money. Essentially, it's like protecting your savings, protecting your store of value. That's why I'm into Bitcoin. I think the financial crisis started a discussion that Bitcoin then accelerated around why the financial system works the way it does and whether or not it should work that way. How can we make it more transparent? How can we make it more fair? How can we improve the world of money for everybody? But it was a very difficult discussion to have with people in the early days of Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I was writing for Finweek magazine at the time and I did a story on Bitcoin in 2011 and some of my colleagues literally laughed at me. They were like, this is the dumbest thing we've ever heard of. It's a bubble, it'll never be worth more than $9. At its height, it was worth $20,000 and it's gonna be worth a lot more than that one day. And every time we see this cycle, we have people laughing, it's not gonna last, it's overinflated. And every time they're right for a very short period of time and then every time they are proven ultimately wrong in the medium term. I believe that one day it's something that you won't have to understand. It just makes your life better. Very few people can tell you exactly how their smartphone works. It doesn't matter because the narrative has become about why it's good for them. What does it enable in their lives? Well, I can speak to my grandchildren. I can stay up to date with the news. I can take pictures of my family. Those are the things that matter. You know, how the processor works and all of the software that makes it possible. Nobody really needs to understand the bits and pieces. <laughs> M-O-N-E, in the middle of the night. At two o'clock in the morning, I followed Laurie and Artis Soweto to witness history being made with a live demonstration of his Bitcoin prepaid meter. Laurie would be Skyping through to a conference on the other side of the world at MIT in Boston, where his friend Ed would be making a Bitcoin payment straight to the meter. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to... Be ready, okay, so... Let's get this whole thing started. They're going to be calling right now okay. in about uh, two minutes. Okay. And then I'm going to come to that classroom. Okay. Shame they've been here for two hours, three hours. They got you at 12. Hi, Ed. This is a packed room in here. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all again. Hi, nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Could you shortly explain uh, what, uh, where you are and, and, and what you're doing there? Sure. I'm in uh, it's a city outside of Johannesburg in South Africa. It's called Soweto. Where I am right now is very close to where Nelson Mandela used to live in his youth. 
And I'm in a small school. We're going to be demonstrating uh, our blockchain prepaid metering system. So this is now uh, one of the electricity boxes. I don't know if you can actually see, but there is a, this is now a, just a, a conventional meter box, but there's a, a, a blockchain enabled meter over there. And uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to go to the classroom and uh, there's uh, some teachers there and, uh, and it's all dark and, and uh, it's going to now make the, the transaction. So let me just, the transaction takes about, it should take about 30 seconds. All right. Okay, well now we wait, I guess. And we hope it works. So anyway, now what's happening is it's now going through the blockchain, the meter is going to detect the payment, it's going to calculate the tariff and then load the required amount of electricity onto the meter. It's, there's nothing on it at the moment, that's why we're in the dark. And uh, hopefully in a few seconds the meter should be activated. I'm now just sitting in one of the classrooms here, so you're going to see uh, the staff. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> this, this should be a few. About 30 seconds. 41 seconds. Okay. All right. <coughs> no, 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 no. Not going to do this. Now this is the this is usually what happens, you know, in a in the live demo. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, there we go. four sons who are, you know, uh, busy. One of the things that I've been involved with is the Cub Scouts. I take my sons there uh, on, a, on a Friday night and we get involved teaching kids how to, you know, be independent and also, more, most importantly, be good citizens. It's very important to get children to consider their communities and their society and to, to be empathetic to other people, uh, to try and make their communities uh, better, to build it up to try and think civic-mindedly. This is the thing that I struggle with. So in Africa, I don't know that it, it helps to resolve third world problems because, I mean, if you, if you live in a hut, you don't have access to the internet, you don't have access to a phone. Do you think that it is actually something that could really genuinely make a practical real-world difference here? I, I tend to think that Cryptocurrencies have potential to solve real-world problems all over the world. You're not going to solve all the problems, certainly. Even if it just becomes a global reserve currency, the local currency for a country becomes less important, where people can trivially shift from whatever the local currency is into Bitcoin. And then it doesn't matter what happens to the local currency. Now your reliance isn't on the government to keep the economy stable, because you've, kind of, you've got a backup, you've got a fallback. That's very powerful. And I think that that's something that could have lasting effects and impact um, in Africa. We've had this leapfrog thing that, that occurs where there's an innovation like digital cell phones when they came out. Those are the first cell phones that really got deployed in South Africa. And because of that, we were on 3G faster than like the United States and most of Europe. And it's just because the infrastructure is a little bit more modern because it was deployed slightly later in the game. There are a class of problems in Africa where we can just leapfrog and you know, use cryptocurrencies to our advantage. And I think that's what's gonna happen. Even though myself on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't use Bitcoin uh, in the way I would like, you know, I do want to be able to spend Bitcoin and I do want to be able to have people out there in this country spending Bitcoin. I want merchants and service providers to accept Bitcoin. So instead of waiting for them to do that, I'm now going and actually providing those tools. 
I will certainly, you know, uh, strive to uh, create the opportunity for people to, to spend it in their day-to-day -day lives and also to accept it in their day-to-day -day lives. Ironically, the story I expected was to be told by a bunch of men in suits just in pursuit of more money. I expected to find bandits and terrorists and everyday Joes organizing dark deeds in dark places. But in the last five and a half years, the story I thought I would be telling about the crypto space in Africa never materialized. I've realized that my pessimism at the beginning of this journey was actually just misplaced. But regardless, that pessimism has now turned to optimism. Not so much because of the tech, but because of the people who are using it to make the circle both bigger and better. And that's what I call the beginning of a revolution. Uh, just off the top of my head. Bitcoin. <laughs> Ethereum Classic. Hunter Coin. Monero. Ethereum. Ripple XRP. Bitcoin Coins. Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Silver, Bitcoin Diamond, Bitcoin Private. All of the things that start with Bitcoin and have another word after it. Dash, Zcash. There's Cardano. EOS. Stellar Lumens. Calibre. Uh, IOTA. There's another one called the Ura. Connect. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. That was like a scam coin. Uh, did I say dash? Of course, dash. Uh, Litecoin cash. <laughs> I'm just a bit blank. Mm, now they're escaping me. These coins. As many as I can. There's. Uh, gee, you know, there's, there's so many, but it's hard to think of them. Uh, Ubu, um, BNB, uh, Prevex, uh, that should be a lot easier. <laughs>